Well, Shoreline Church, we are on a journey, a 12-week journey walking through the book of Romans, this amazing book of Scripture inspired by the Spirit of God, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Rome. And this book takes us to the depth of our theology, what we believe. Theologians call that orthodoxy, orthodox biblical belief. And when that foundation of belief is established, we begin to build our lives on that orthopraxy, how we practice what we believe, how we live it out. And so uh, two weeks ago, we began by talking about Romans chapter 1 and the doctrine of sin, the reality of sin. What the book of Romans is doing is it's giving God's solution, solving the problem of sin, and you can't get to the solution until you deal with the problem. So right out of the gate, the Apostle Paul talks the entire chapter about the reality of sin, the downward spiral of sin. If you weren't here for that week, if you didn't watch it online, I encourage you to go online and watch that message. And then you move to Romans chapter 2, which we talked about last week, righteousness, that God is righteous, God is true, God is perfect through and through. And that righteous God calls you and me to righteousness. That we would be made fully righteous. And what God begins to unveil in Romans chapter 2 is that we can't get there on our own. As human beings, we try to become self-righteous by judgmentalism, comparing ourselves to others. I'm better than her. I'm better than him. Or by legalism. Well, if I, if I have my list of do's and don'ts, every legalist has a list, and if I do my do's and don't do my don'ts, I'm good enough, and somehow I become self-righteous, and I, I sort of lift myself up to God. Look at God, I'm good enough, because I'm better than them, or I follow the rules and regulations. But what Romans 2 says is, we cannot attain that place of righteousness on our own. And what's clear all through the Bible, but the book of Romans makes it crystal clear, is that this God who made us, this God who loves us, this God who is holy, 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 and absolutely righteous, says you cannot make yourself righteous, but I will give you my righteousness through my only son, Jesus Christ, by faith in him. And so chapter 3 of the book of Romans is dealing with the topic of faithfulness, that a God who is faithful to us, who loves us, who pursues us in his love, who offers us his righteousness, that faithful God calls us to put our faith in him. And when we place our faith in him, we learn to walk in faithfulness in his power as his spirit lives in us, as a desire to honor him and live for him, not trying to get him to love us, not trying to be self-righteous, coming and saying, Lord, I'm not righteous. I can't save myself, but I cast myself on the mercy of Jesus. And in faith, I receive his grace. That's the message of Romans chapter 3. That's what we're thinking about today. And and we all understand the beauty and the wonder of faithfulness. When someone's faithful to you, man, it means so much. In a world where there's a lot of faithlessness, uh, God is faithful to us. And there, there is a pain to faithlessness. And you have felt it, and I have felt it in different ways. In a friendship, where you're walking with someone as a friend, you build a relationship over time, and at some point along the way, they just go, I've had enough, and they walk away. I remember a time in my relational world where I had a person I had been friends with for years, and I had poured a lot into that relationship, and at a certain point, I sort of realized it was kind of one-sided. I was pouring into the relationship, and the other person wasn't kind of reciprocating, wasn't connecting back. And so I said to my wife, I said, honey, I got a feeling that if I never called that friend or reached out to that friend again, I might never hear from them. She said, really? I said, yeah. So I waited a week, and I waited a month, and I waited a year. And I found out it was one-sided. one-sided. And, and I wasn't being faithless to them. I realized that they, they didn't have that same kind of relationship. There, there was something painful about realizing that this person didn't really have a relationship with me. I had a relationship with them. Uh, that, that, that moment for me was difficult. It was painful. It can happen in a marriage where someone says, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. And for whatever reasons, that that unravels. And one becomes unfaithful to the other. And and if you've had someone be unfaithful at that level, at that core level of a marriage covenantal relationship, you understand the pain of broken faith, of faithlessness. It's deep and it's profound. I had a, a gentleman who was part of my life when I was in college. He was actually my college Greek teacher, one of the top Greek scholars in the world. Matter of fact, today... If you look at the top scholarly works in the language of Greek, especially on teaching Greek, this guy wrote them. 
I mean, he was, at the time, the stuff we were using, he was quite young, was new stuff he was developing. Now it's become the standard for learning Greek in seminaries and colleges all over the world. And, th- and this teacher loved Jesus so much. He loved the word of God so much. He taught us with such passion. And one of his dreams and desires was to found a church, to start a church. And eventually when he actually started doing all of his, his books online and teaching online, he was able to then start a congregation. He started a church in the Pacific Northwest. And this church started as this baby little church and it struggled like all baby churches do. And it got past that, the difficult beginning years and it grew and it became kind of solid and healthy. Then it began to grow and kind of expand. It became this very dynamic church. And about that point, his board came to him and said, thanks for all you've done. Uh, you can go now. And they fired him after he started the church and poured his life into it through all the hard years. And when things got solid, they kind of moved on from him. And I remember seeing him at a conference and I didn't know this had happened. I knew that he was pastoring a church. So I saw him. I said, hey, how's your church doing? And the look on his face was a look of devastation. He, he just said, well, actually, do you have about an hour? And I said, actually, I do. And we went and sat down, and he told me the story. He poured himself into this church. And when they finally got through the hard years and became, had kind of a solid footing, the board of the church fired him. And he was still feeling the pain of it. And this is a grown-up, mature man. <clears throat> but you could see the pain in his eyes and the pain in his heart. Faithlessness, brokenness is so difficult. I, I think also of a couple I met years ago uh, as a story of faithlessness and faithfulness. I met this couple when I became a pastor at the first church I served in Michigan years ago. And I met this couple. They were grandparents. They had seven kids and I think 15 or 20, they had a boatload of grandkids, and they were just the most, they loved each other, they loved their kids, this wonderful model Christian couple, and so this, the, the husband in this couple became part of a preaching group. I started training some lay preachers to go and preach in the local prisons, and he was part of that training, and I said, at one point I said, hey, tell me your story, tell me your marriage story, tell me you got such an amazing, beautiful family, and he looked at me and he said, you really want to hear my story? And I said, I do, and he told me his story about how after they had seven children, he fell in love, fell in love with another woman. He, he got in a relationship with another woman and he left his wife and his seven kids. And for more than 10 years, he was gone. He deserted them. He had no interest in them. He moved on with his life. And this wife prayed and said, Jesus, I can't make it without a man in my life. I can't make it raising these seven kids. And God put on her heart, and she said this very clearly, You pray and you wait. He's coming back. And she prayed and she waited for over 10 years. I'm not saying that's what every person has to do when they're abandoned by somebody. But in her case, she felt God's call. He is being faithless, unfaithful. You remain faithful. And finally, he came to his senses and he came home. And after a time of restoration and healing and working through a lot of what was involved in that, their relationship was restored. And when I met them, they were this beautiful, loving, supportive, grandparent, parent, wonderful couple. I didn't know the whole story. We all have stories and experiences of great faithfulness and the joy that brings and faithlessness. And in Romans chapter 3, what we discover is that God that we worship, the God that we study in the scriptures, the God who walks with us day by day and moment by moment is always faithful. He is a faithful God. God is faithful always. Look with me at Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And just let these words kind of wash over your soul and paint a picture in your mind of this God who made you, of this God who loves you, of this God we gather to worship today. Romans 3, 1. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now, here's the question. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. So the Apostle Paul starts chapter 3 of Romans right where he left off in chapter 2. In chapter 2, he's saying, you try to make yourself righteous by saying, we follow the law. 
And we observe circumcision. We follow the rules and regulations. We follow the rights. We do these things. And that's what makes us righteous. And Paul goes on, and we learned this last week. He goes on to say, listen, following the rules and regulations doesn't make you righteous. Being Jewish doesn't make you, it's not your bloodline, doesn't make you righteous. Being circumcised, following the, the Abrahamic covenant, he says that doesn't make you righteous. So the natural question, if you've been living your life believing that circumcision and the law and all these things make you righteous, here's the natural question. Well, then what good is it? What's the advantage then of being Jewish? Or what's the value of circumcision? I mean, so you're telling us they mean nothing? They don't make us righteous? And Paul says, no. They mean something very important. It's just what they don't deal with is making you righteous. It's something actually so much more than that. So they ask the question, he's asking on their behalf, so what advantage then is there in being a Jew? What value is there in, in circumcision? And Paul says, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. He says, God entrusted to you his word. God gave you to you the law. God gave to you the covenants. These are blessings. They aren't the things that save you, but it's an incredible blessing, but you're being blessed to be a blessing to the nations. That's what God told Abraham all the way back in Genesis. He said, I will bless you that you would be a blessing to all the nations. That's what God wants to do. He wants to work through us to be a blessing. And so then the question becomes, okay, well then God calls people and he gives them a mission. Is it that they get blessed or is it that they become a blessing? Well, the answer is both. But what, what's really clear is that righteousness does not come by being Jewish, by following the law, by being circumcised. Paul excludes all those things. Why is he excluding those things? Because that's what they're relying on. And what he's trying to say is, but I want to make it so clear, we're going to take away every other possible legalism, judgmentalism. Okay, you're circumcised. All these, okay, those aren't what save you. Those don't make you righteous. Then what's left? He's stripping everything away so he can say, there's only one who can make you righteous. His name is, and you know the name, Jesus he makes us righteous when we put our faith in him who is faithful. And so the apostle goes on, goes on to, to clarify. So if we're unfaithful, if we don't get it, if we don't follow, does that nullify the fact that God is faithful to us because God's always faithful? He says, not at all. What we decide to do doesn't change God's faithfulness to us. Let God be true. God is faithful. God is true no matter what. Even if every human being rejects and denies and even lies, God will remain faithful. Why? Because this is what we're learning in terms of orthodoxy. Our God is a faithful God. He is holy. He is righteous. He will judge sin, but he is faithful to pursue us to the end because he wants us to know him and love him and receive his grace and receive his blessing. I've shared with uh, the congregation at different times through the years that I grew up in a home I was not a real big musical guy. My sisters were in madrigals, and my brother's a choral conductor. And I mean, my, my music, all, everyone in my family was just into music, not so much me. But we went to all kinds of musicals. And I saw four, eight, ten versions of, of West Side Story and uh, of, of you know, Fiddler on the Roof. And I, I always loved Fiddler on the Roof long before I was a Christian. I loved how Tevia, the main character, the dad of this family, that the story kind of revolves around. As he's just doing his work and, and pushing a milk cart and do, you know, doing his work, he'll just talk to God. He'll say, Lord, he'll say, Father, and he just talks to this guy, talks to God. But you can see this beautiful relationship. It's what I learned later when my wife taught me about praying with your eyes wide open. He would just talk to God through his day. It was beautiful. It was powerful. But there's one scene where, where he's talking to God, and he says, God, he says, I know we're the chosen people. But maybe just sometimes you could choose someone else. And his point is, it's not always easy to be chosen. If you're chosen just to get blessed, then that's always nice. But if you're chosen to be a vehicle and a conduit of the grace of God and the message of God and the truth of God, that's work. That's a calling. But that's, that's exactly what God is saying. He's saying to the Jewish people, I'm not making you sort of this, this special, unique people in that you're all saved because you happen to have a certain blood that runs through your veins. He's saying, I'm calling you that I can bring my law and bring my truth and bring my message and through you bless the whole world because God desires to bless the whole world. That's the heart of God. Chapter one of Romans, sin is real. Chapter two, God is righteous. He wants to make us right. Chapter number three, it's through faith. 
God's faithfulness to bring Jesus and our response of faith to receive him that can make us righteous and change everything. This is why we're calling this a journey through Romans because it's this logical journey of progression of doctrine, of learning, of truth. Human beings are sinful. God is righteous. He calls us to righteousness. We cannot get there on our own as much as we might try. So we strip all that away. And then this faithful God says, I invite you to place your faith in my son Jesus. It's beautiful. It's powerful. And when you begin to read Romans through that lens and understand what it says, it all comes alive. It's beautiful and it's powerful. So our God is a faithful God. Here's a question for you. How have you experienced God's faithfulness? How have you in your own life, and just quiet your heart for a moment, and just think, how have I experienced the faithfulness of God? His presence in your pain, in those painful times of life, where you would not have made it through, were it not for the very presence of the Spirit of the living God. He's been faithful in those moments. His power in your weakness. In those, in those moments when you say, I can't, I have nothing left, I'm empty, and God just by his spirit sweeps in and fills you, and you do what you could have never done on your own. And you say, oh, God is faithful to give me power in my weakness. When you recognize his undeserved grace, when you say, God, you have given undeserved gifts to me through the hand of Jesus, and you have been faithful. And, and when you say, and I know I don't deserve it. And I did nothing to earn it. Yet God, you are faithful. When you look at the people that God has put into your life. Who love you. Who care about you. Who strive to be faithful. To come alongside of you. And you say, oh God, you've been faithful to give me people. And maybe it's not hundreds of people. Maybe it's three or four or five people. But boy, if you have a few people in your life who love you and walk with you. You say, what a gift from God. He's been faithful. When you look at the resources you have, a, a, a cuddly pet or a great meal or time, you know, time with friends or whatever it is, when God puts people around you, family who care about you, every person, every gift. The book of James says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good gift from the God who is faithful. You know that experience and so do I. How have you experienced God's faithfulness. It's important every so often just to kind of slow down. And think, oh God, you've been so faithful. And just to walk through your week and walk through your year, even a year like 2020, where there's been lots of tough stuff, God has been faithful to you and to me if we've put our faith in him. He is a faithful God. There's a great hymn of the church, and I didn't grow up in the church, and some of you grew up in the church, some of you didn't, but if you grew up in the church, you probably grew up singing a song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And then there's this great hymn, Great is Your Faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with you. You change us not, or the old verses, Thou changest not, Thy compassions they fail not, as you have been, or as Thou hast been, Thou forever shalt be. You can do it with the old English or the new English, but the point is the same. And then, then, then the, the chorus, great is your faithfulness, great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Just to singing God's faithfulness. Are there those moments where you're just moved to celebrate God that way? Now, this is really interesting. You may have sung that song for the last, you know, 20 years or 30 years or 50 years or 70 years of your life if you grew up in the church. You may have sung that song a lot of times, but you may not know the passage of Scripture that inspired the writer of that hymn to write the hymn. And it's Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The book of Lamentations is, is really bound together with the book of Jeremiah, and it's in a time of pain and sorrow. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And so the person who wrote Great is Thy Faithfulness, the passage that inspired them, came out of one of the most heart-wrenching, painful moments in the history of God's people and one of the most painful books in the Bible, Lamentations, this lament of sorrow. And yet in the midst of even the most deep and dark times, we can say, great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. What a declaration. I hope you understand that. I hope if you're a follower of Jesus, you live declaring that God is faithful even when tough are times are tough. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, when you finally put your faith in him, that you could live with that profound understanding. 
So then the next thing the Apostle Paul tackles is he's sort of asking this question. Does any group have a special advantage? Is there any group of people, particularly the Jewish people, is there any group that has a special advantage? And his answer is no. All are the same in God's sight. And I will say right now, for those of you that grew up in a, in a church background where the theological sort of disposition and structure was what's called dispensationalism, you might have been taught that God has a certain plan for the Jewish people and a certain plan for everyone else. I don't believe that's biblical at all, and Romans really dismantles that completely. It's very, Romans is very clear that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ for all people. And so the Apostle Paul is addressing this. Is there a certain group that has a special advantage because there were some people who thought that they did? And so look with me at verse 9 of Romans chapter 3. Here's the question. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? When the Apostle Paul says we, he's talking about, do we the Jewish people, do we have any advantage? And here's his response. Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles, the Jewish people and non-Jewish people alike, are all under the power of sin. He's asking the question, is one group specially loved by God, specially cherished by God, have a special plan to get to God that doesn't involve Jesus? And he's saying, not at all. Every human being comes before God the same. And to the Jewish mind in the first century, there were two groups of people in all the world. There were the Jewish people and there were everyone else. They were called the Gentiles. And they had this idea that God's, special, God's plan is just for us and it's a plan that makes us righteous and makes us special. And God says, no, I have a special plan for you. I'm gonna use you as my servants to serve the world and bring my gospel. But it's not one that sets you apart as righteous. It's one that, one that makes you my worker to then share with the world so that they can become righteous even as you can become righteous through the coming Messiah through Jesus Christ, who in our lives and in the world has come and died on a cross, paid the price, was buried for three days, and rose again in glory. And so the Apostle Paul is really going after this and, and clarifying that there's not a special advantage for any group, but that every person comes before God in the same sort of way. And then the Apostle Paul sort of circles back to what he talked about in chapter 1 of Romans, the reality of human fallenness, because now he's, he's kind of preparing the way to deal with the call to faith and to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So he wants to kind of remind them, he's going back to chapter 1, the reality of sin. And so the Apostle Paul begins to kind of quote from different parts of the Old Testament and begins to clarify some things. So Romans chapter 3, 10 through 18, we read this. As it is written, pointing backward, all right? As it is written... There is no one righteous, not even one. Who's righteous on their own? No one, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. In their own power, in their strength, in their own strength no one seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Is this unclear? He's saying nobody is righteous. No one does good, not even one. Let's get more specific. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In case you're wondering, is my, righteous enough? is my righteousness enough? In case you're wondering, can I get to God on my own? He just wants to say one more time as he gets to this message of the good news of Jesus that no human effort, there's no human being good enough who strives hard enough, whose heart is right enough to find God without God's grace pursuing them first. And so just a question to think about as, as we recognize, okay, my mind is not always what God wants to be. My words aren't always what God wants me to say. My actions aren't always right. I, okay, I recognize my sin. Here's the question. Could I stand before the perfect and holy God of the universe and say, I am perfect, God, just like you? You know, could you or I stand before God Almighty? And even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and if I said to you, okay, you're not, you're not yet a Christian, but I said, to you, if there was a perfect God who always did what is right and good and beautiful and true, if there's a perfect God, would that God look at you and say, you're just as good as I am? You've done no wrong. And we all know the answer to that. And that's what Paul is saying. None is righteous. No, not one. We all sin. We all fall short of God's glory. We can't stand before God and say, I am righteous in my own power. I'm perfect. And so then the Apostle Paul clarifies, true faithfulness 
is not obedience to the law. It can't be. He's kind of tying the whole thing together. He's putting on a bow on it and saying, you've got to understand, okay, remember sin, it's strong. The law can't save you. Your righteousness can't save you. And then obedience, he's supposed to say one more time, obedience to following the laws is impossible. You can't do it. So I want to let you know why you can't be saved that way so I can let you know how you can be transformed and saved. So look with me at Romans 3, 19 and 20. And the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, writes these words. Romans 3, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. He's saying, listen, when you understand what the law says, it, it basically makes you shut your mouth and stop your bragging and look how good I am. It, says it, sh- it shows you the reality of your own sin. That every mouth may be silenced, the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Just pause there. If you have your Bibles open, if you have your Bible app open, look at those words. If it's unclear, all right? Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. So who can follow the law enough and do enough good things to be right in God's sight? What's the answer? No one. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. When we read the law of God, It's not put there to make us say, so I guess I have to follow all these things for God to love me. It's put there to help us understand I could never rise up to that standard in my own power. And so I cast myself on God just as I am in my brokenness and my sin and my frailty and my rebellion in my bitterness in the deceit of my mind and the foulness of my lips and the wrongness of my actions, I come and say, God, I can't make myself right. The law isn't meant to give us a standard that we have to measure up to to be loved by God. It's meant to help us understand that even though we're broken and sinful, God loves us anyways, and the righteous God has made a way to make us right, aside from us following the law, but by casting ourselves on the mercy of Jesus. That's where Paul is taking us. Do you get the picture? This, this is why this is such a deeply theological book because the Apostle Paul is like, like a rabbi walking us through this process to fully understand in our minds our, our orthodoxy to know what we believe so we can then respond and live in a way that honors Jesus. It makes us conscious of our sin. So here's a question for you. Why is profound awareness of our sin essential for true faith? Why why must we be profoundly, clearly, personally aware of our sin? And the answer should be obvious from reading Romans. Because then we realize we can't save ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. We can't be self-righteous or judgmental or law keepers and think that's going to be enough. We become aware of our sins so we can say, I cannot make it. And, and there, there was a, another hymn. I don't know why in this sermon, I didn't, again, I didn't grow up in the church, but I spent enough years as in, in, my, in my 20s and 30s in uh, some more traditional churches that sang the hymns. And some, some of these hymns have beautiful, rich theology. But I remember this one hymn the congregation would sing, and the first time I heard it, it just seemed strange. Because everybody stood up, when, when people would sing the hymns, they'd all stand up together. And they'd have, they'd have their little hymn books. And there was this one hymn called, only a sinner saved by grace. And I remember the congregation standing, men and women and children, and singing these words. And the words weren't, look how much God loves me. The words weren't, look how wonderful I am. The words weren't, look all these blessings I have. The, the, basically, the words went like this. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. That's not self-degradation. That's not what that is. That's theological truth. And to be able to stand and say, I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. To God be the glory. Not look at all my, look at all my do's and don'ts that I followed. Not look at how I put other people down and judge them. I just stand before God. And say, I come to you empty. This is why in all the Billy Graham crusades through all the years, when Billy Graham would do a crusade, when he'd invite people to receive Jesus, which I'm going to invite you to do if you've never done it before today. But when Billy Graham would invite people to receive Jesus, this one guy who traveled with him, his name was George Beverly Shea. He he would sing this song, and the song's called Just As I Am. And, and, And 
through the years, hundreds of thousands of people stood up and walked and came and knelt down and said, I received Jesus while these words were being sung. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am. And here's the next verse. Just as I am, right where I am right now, with all my brokenness, all my problems, just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. At 16 years old, when I came to Jesus, I didn't have any self-righteousness. I knew I was messed up. I knew I was broken. But I was able to come and say, God, if you love me, if Jesus died for me, if he paid the price on the cross, I receive his grace. And on that day, my whole life changed. God washed me clean. His spirit moved into me. And I can tell you right now, I am only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. Not my good works. No way. And can I say, not your good works. No way. Our story is coming to God with empty hands just as we are. Not self-righteous, but aware of our sin. And saying, God, if you could love me the way I am, if your grace is enough to cover me, if Jesus' death can pay the price for my sins and give me new life, I receive Jesus. That's the gift of faith. God's grace through Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul is bringing us to. He's trying to strip away all the self-sufficiency and all the self-righteousness. And so the Apostle Paul goes on to say this, that righteousness comes through faith in Jesus, period. There's nothing else to add to it. Look at verse 21 of Romans 3. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now listen to this. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Through faith in Jesus, only faith. For the theologian is called sola fide, faith alone. We are justified. We are made right through faith in Jesus Christ alone, nothing else. There's nothing to add to it. And then to kind of clarify who needs this grace, who can ex express faith to God and receive the grace of Jesus. Paul goes on to show this, that all have sinned. No one deserves grace, but Jesus offered his life to be received by faith. He said, I offer it, receive it by faith. Who deserves this? Nobody. Continue with me in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. That's the cross. He presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. By faith. Faith alone. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It all comes down to Jesus. So here's my question. Have you accepted God's grace gift by faith? Have you, have you accepted this gift of grace? And I hope and pray you have. And so I want to speak to just to three kinds of people, just briefly. First, if you have received this gift of grace, if it was like it was for my wife Sherry when she was five years old, or for me when I was 16 years old, or in your 30s or 40s or 70s or 80s, if you've come to the cross and said, my righteousness is not enough, I can't fix myself. I can't do enough good things. I can't judge enough people or do enough, follow enough laws and rules and regulations or religious do's and don'ts. But I come just as I am and I cast myself on the mercy of Jesus. And I say, Jesus, you died on the cross. You died in my place. You paid for my sins and I accept your forgiveness and grace. I give you all my sins. I confess all my wrongs and I receive your grace and I receive a relationship with you. 
the forgiveness of my wrongs, and now your leadership as I take your hand, Jesus, and as I follow you all the days of my life. If you've done that, I want to challenge you to say from this moment, as re just remembering that I've made that commitment to Jesus, may I pursue him with all my heart. He is faithful to me. I've placed my faith in him. Now I can live faithfully for him. Not to gain his love. He loved me. He was faithful before I ever was faithful to him. But because he was faithful and I've received my faith, I can walk in faithfulness. And in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about what does that look like to walk in faithfulness. But if, you, if you've received Jesus, I want to ask you to begin praying. God, where can I grow in faithfulness to you? Because you have been so faithful to me. And then, if you're, if you're online today and you're listening to this message, you're saying, this is starting to make sense. And I, I've been trying to live self-righteously. I've, I've been waiting to come to Jesus till I do enough good things and I clean my act up a little bit. If I can kind of earn enough to feel worthy. And, and maybe today you're realizing, I can't make myself, I can't follow the laws enough. I can't do enough things that, that God offers his righteousness through Jesus Christ as a gift of grace, not by my works. And maybe you've never got that before. And you want to say right now, I want to, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive his grace by faith. I want to put my faith in him right now. If that's you right now, I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. The message isn't quite over yet, but we're going to pause right now. And I want to ask you to pray with me. Would you pray right now in your heart before God Almighty? Will you say, dear God, I, I'm, I'm starting to understand it. That you love me, God. You're faithful to me even when I've been faithless. That, God, you've loved me even when I didn't love you. That, God Almighty, you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me because I couldn't pay the price for myself. So I confess my sins to you, God, right now. I give you all my sins. Every sin I can remember and every sin I can't remember. I give you all of them. And I receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I accept you, Jesus, as my forgiver, as the one who cleanses me of all my wrongs. I receive this great gift of your grace. And Jesus, from this day forward, I will take your hand and walk with you. Lead me, Jesus. Guide me, Savior. And teach me to live a life faithfully for you, not to earn your love, but to declare to the world that you gave me your love before I ever deserved it. And if you prayed that prayer in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to respond and let us follow up with you. And then the third group. Maybe, maybe you, you haven't yet received Jesus in the past, and maybe even today you're saying, I'm just, I got some questions, some things I'm working through. I'm just not quite there yet. I want to invite you in just a moment to respond and let us know that you'd like to grow and move forward. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But, but this message of the Apostle Paul is so powerful, is so clear, is so life-changing. And the Apostle Paul kind of finishes by basically saying, okay, so now that we know it's all by grace, it's all by God's righteousness, he says, no boasting, no boasting, but a response of faithfulness. We can't boast in what God did for us. It was a gift. We can respond to his faithfulness by being faithful. So the Apostle Paul asked the question in verse 27. So where then is boasting? You know, where, where's the room for boasting? He says, it's excluded. And, and you get that now as you, as you get the flow of Romans. You go, of course it's excluded. I didn't do anything. It wasn't my judgmentalism, my legalism, my actions, my being circumcised, being Jewish. It wasn't my bloodline. It was Jesus. So, where's, so where then is boasting? It's excluded. Because of the law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. God is faithful. We respond by faith. We walk in faithfulness. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. It's not the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. All one family in God. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Now we live it out. 
Not trying to earn God's love, but by understanding he's given it freely and faithfully, and now we walk with him. So here's the last question. What is my next step of obedience to God's will and ways? What's my next step? Where does God want me to begin moving forward in growth, to walk with him, to live for him? And why follow God's ways, his will, and his laws. Why would I follow God's ways and his will and his laws? And here it is. Joyful surrender to his will is an act of thankfulness and faithfulness. To joyfully walk in God's will is our response that we know that God has been good to us. So as a first step, I want to ask you to respond right now. You're going to see a a number, a phone number on the screen. I'm going to ask every single person listening to really think and pray about responding. So if you don't have a phone, get your phone, take it out. It's usually pretty close. If you're watching on your phone, go to your phone feature, open up your text, and put in this number, and I'm going to ask you to send one of three words. If you prayed for the first time today to receive Jesus Christ, if you asked by faith, and you put your faith in him, and you said, I believe in you, Jesus, and you received him today, will you just text one word, faith, to that number? And we will follow up with you and help you on this journey of faith as we continue to walk through Romans, as you begin to grow in your faith. If you made a commitment to Jesus today, text the word faith. Second, if you are a Christian, but right now you're saying, I want to grow in faithfulness. I want to walk more closely with God. Will you text the word grow? Just text the word grow right now to that number. And we'll follow up with you and give you some encouragement and some ideas of steps for you to be growing and moving forward in your faith. And then third, if you say, I'm not, I wasn't a Christian before the service began, I'm not quite there yet, I'm curious, I'm open, but I'm not quite there yet, but I want to know more, will you text the word learn? The word learn. And we will respond to you and give you some tools and ways to move forward in learning more about Jesus. In this journey through Romans, this life-changing, powerful journey, we learn in chapter one the reality of sin. Chapter two, that we have a righteous God who says, I want to make you righteous, but you can't make yourself righteous. And here in chapter three, we discover this faithful God who waits and waits and waits for us because he loves us. And when we're ready and we respond, his arms are open, he invites us home. And then by faith, we follow him. And he says, now you walk faithfully with me. And that's the journey we're going to continue next week. Lord Jesus, I pray as we close this time together that every single one of us will take a next step forward. For followers of yours who've been Christians for a long time or maybe recent believers, Lord, that we will take our next step of spiritual growth. For those that have prayed today for the first time to receive you, Jesus Christ, will you let them know that you want to walk with them and grow them and transform their life. And I pray as we follow up with them, as they text us and we follow up, Lord, that they will start that journey of growth. And oh, Lord, for those people who are still wondering and curious, I thank you that they have the courage to say, I want to learn. And I pray we can walk with them in this journey of learning as we walk through the book of Romans together. Jesus, thank you for your word that is powerful, for your spirit that is present, and for your glory that is life-changing in our lives. Let us receive your faithful love and the gift of grace that we might walk in faith and become more faithful to you. In the power of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of quick invitations, and then I want to just give you a word of blessing to send you off. First, if you want prayer for anything right now, simply call the number below, and we have people waiting to pray with you. They would love to pray with you, so call right away. If you're new to Shoreline, we welcome you personally. I wish you could be here with us on our campus. Hopefully someday soon we'll be able to do that. But if you're new, just text the word welcome uh, to the number you see there and we will get back to you and give you a warm personal welcome. I want to challenge you to go on to our website and learn more about Shoreline Conversations, our podcast. We're taking this topic and we're just digging deeper and going on that journey a little bit more, some some little side trips on this little journey we're taking together, going deeper into the book of Romans. If you want information about anything at Shoreline, when's this starting? Is this happening? What are we doing at Christmas time? Whatever it is, we're planning ahead. We can answer your questions. You send your questions, you email to the email you see below, and we will respond back to you. And then also, we thank you for your faithfulness in giving. 
And thank you that, that so many of you have been so faithful. I want to challenge you. Maybe your next step forward in faithfulness is if you say, I've been part of Shoreline for months or years. I haven't been faithful in my giving. I challenge you to go online and to set up regular giving and make it part of your lifestyle. It will be a blessing to you. It will be a blessing to the church. And it will be a blessing to the heart of God. But I challenge you, and so you see on the screen different ways you can begin giving back or continue your faithful work of giving back. I want to send you with a word of blessing. If you're able to stand, feel free to stand if you want to right now. And if you want to kind of turn your hands open like this, just to receive, the, just almost like you're receiving a good gift or a good snack, put your hands up, ready to receive. And let me just share these words of blessing. As we close this time together, may you walk in the presence and the power of the faithful God. May your faith in Jesus grow with each passing day. And may you live faithfully for him, walking in his presence every moment of every day. God bless you, and we'll see you back together again next weekend.